Hello and welcome to the Monday, July 30th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. As I've mentioned a couple times before, we have seen a number of different extortion emails recently that took advantage of leaked passwords. Rick posted a summary of the activity that he has seen from this scam by monitoring Bitcoin addresses that he collected from these emails. He collected a total of 334 addresses. We have seen some reuse of these addresses so it's not easy to figure out how many addresses were used in total and sort of what these 334 addresses represent that Rick monitored. But 57 of these addresses have received payments. Now, these 56 addresses have received a total of 123 payments, again, pointing to at least some reuse of these addresses. We can not easily derive as a result the actual success rate of these emails, but it does suggest that uh, my best guess would be a few percent success here, maybe up to about 10% of the emails actually result in payments. And the total amount of Bitcoin deposited in these addresses does amount to about $200,000. At this point, we haven't really seen any money being removed from these addresses. So it looks like the hacker is still waiting for a good day to actually reap the profits from their work. And security researcher Ivan Kwiatkowski came across a number of websites that distributed well-known software laced with adware. Now, the software itself was legitimate. For example, KeePass was used in this attack or Audacity, the software that I'm actually using to record this podcast. But if you downloaded the software from one of the affected sites, you actually ended up with the software and some adware. Now, why would you go to another site? In this case, the attacker actually used a very simple trick. They registered domain using the france.fr or the spain.es top level domain. So instead of keypass.com, they used keypass.fr. So it's not that the affected software vendors did anything wrong here. The attacker just downloaded their software, added the adware, and then put it up on their particular site. Now, Bleeping Computer has a list of all possible sites that they found following this particular scheme. Not all of these sites, interestingly, does distribute adware at this point. Some of them actually distribute the authentic software without any additional add-ons. But that, of course, may just be a matter of trying to sort of be labeled as legitimate by various virus scanners and the like. Also, I've seen sometimes in the past with malware where a particular website will deliver you malware one time and then if you come there the second time, it will either blacklist your IP address or in the more simple case, set a cookie and then just so show you spam. So it's very possible that this particular actor sort of profiles people requesting these files and once you request a file a certain number of time, given that all of these hosts appear to be pointed to the same IP address, they will just essentially lock you out and deliver the non-malicious software. So in other words, be aware where you get your software from and make sure that you validate any URLs that you download it from. But my next story shows exactly how difficult this can be. Microsoft's research team found an unspecified PDF editor that installed a crypto miner. The application itself and its installer was actually not affected by the attack. But as so often, the installer then includes components provided by secondary companies, which turned out to be compromised in this case. So this is a bit more tricky to detect as the actual application application is clean, it comes from the authentic source, and it will pass all tests. But once the installer runs, it will then download the malware. Software installers often install dependencies like libraries, artwork, fonts, and the like 
from different sources and in the end it's the responsibility of the company providing the application to secure its supply chain. But that turns out to be difficult in part uh, if there are multiple levels of uh, these dependencies. It could be that your application does include a library from a vendor that you trust, but that library itself now includes additional components from a third party. And of course, you have no idea that they even exist or where they exactly come from. Microsoft calls this an attack on the supply chain of your supply chain. And yes, that's uh, of course certainly possible. Where I see this actually happening more is not so much uh, desktop applications, but web applications, websites that are including components from third parties, maybe simple stuff like Google AdWords or for example, jQuery libraries and the like. It's always preferred to host as much of this yourself as you can, because that makes it a lot easier for you to actually control what's happening with this. In the web and HTML world, there's actually a particular tag, a particular trick that is implemented now called sub-resource integrity, where you essentially implement a hash that you add to your script tags and such that will verify whether or not the file being downloaded is authentic. I don't see this feature used a lot in part because there's of course a denial of service possibility if the provider of this JavaScript library or whatever you're including here does make a legitimate change to the library while well, loading of the library will be blocked because it no longer matches this hash. Well, that's it for today. And just as a reminder, first week September, I'll actually be in Amsterdam for all of the European listeners and I'll be teaching our Defending Web Applications class. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.